So Gary, tell us a little bit about um, your experience, Linda's experience, um, having a dementia that was young onset and atypical. What would you What would you say about all that? It was difficult um, at first too for the doctors because it took us a long time to get an accurate diagnosis, and um, um, we went, because I'm retired, we went to a, a number of. Uh, Naval hospitals and in fact Bethesda um, at the time, and they couldn't they could identify there was something wrong with they couldn't tell exactly what it was but they thought it was they kept wanting to go Alzheimer's but they just really looked like Alzheimer's. We kept trying different places and uh, a lot of respected uh, uh, medical centers and um, what were the first symptoms that first thing. Um, Linda had been taking some classes in preparation for us to go to um, uh, graduate school after mm -hmm. after uh, I'd retired and she retired. Lifelong learners, yeah, you guys and, are lifelong learners. And the kids yeah. were off to school, and so yeah. um, uh, and she noticed uh, something uncharacteristic, where she was having trouble finding. She knew what the the names were, or the answers were, to some uh, things on tests that she was taking, mm -hmm. uh, but she couldn't write it down. She couldn't put the word down. Wow. And so she knew something was wrong, and so we um, talked to um, uh, doctors about it, and they and they just you know attributed it to stress maybe. And um, mm, okay. in fact, but because she had mentioned to her doctor, um, they kept uh, I had applied for long term care insurance for both of us at age fifty because she had that on on her uh, medical records that the doctor had asked. She said, "Well, I did have a little bit of mm. memory issues on this test." Gotcha. That, that kept her from ever getting it. Ah, yeah, oh, so, so yeah. ouch. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so we went to a number of places and... Um, um, years or months to get the diagnosis? Years. Years. Yeah. And she ended up finally being identified as having... Yeah. One of the places we went was um, uh, Yale and the mm -hmm. a doctor there thought she finally might know what it is and referred us to uh, Northwestern University. Mm -hmm. um, uh, medical school, and uh, uh, there's a center there for um, people with PPA, primary mm -hmm. progressive aphasia, mm -hmm. a rare form of frontotemporal dementia. Yeah. And the doctor, I think that he actually named the disease. Uh, we saw him, and um, he um, um, diagnosed her fairly quickly with with PPA. Yeah, it was it was hard. That meeting was hard because we. We never had a, an answer until then, and then uh, going in there, we had great hopes that we were going to finally have an answer, and we we're going to be able to treat, treat it. it. There's going to be some way that we could she could live with this, or get rid of it, or whatever. And then we were told in that meeting that um, um, that that wasn't going to happen, and and he gave us kind of a roadmap of of what to expect, and it was pretty devastating. Wow. And, um, so the roadmap was sort of toward the what it would look like as you progressed to the end. Right. Was there any was there any conversation about some people with primary progressive aphasia simply stabilize and stay in that yeah, we, case? Yeah, we, we asked about that, yeah. and um, he mm -hmm. said that there, there could be plateaus, mm -hmm. but um, but basically that wasn't going to happen. It wasn't going to be okay. a permanent plateau. It was going to mm -hmm. keep progressing, progressing. So that was pretty devastating. Yeah, that's very devastating. Yeah. yeah. Was there a conversation at the same time about what you could do, what Linda would be able to do, and so what you should work toward in the short term, at least, uh, for living life well in the interim. I'd say, unfortunately, no. Most of the mm -hmm. most of the uh, doctors we saw were primarily focused on diagnosis and treatment, if there was a potential for treatment. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the place we went to in uh, Chicago at uh, Northwestern uh, did have. Uh, um, uh, and they still do have a, re, uh, a active research program mm -hmm. into it, which is good. And um, uh, and there were some things that we were able to tap into there, some resources they had, which was which was helpful. But a lot of the places we went to, that that was not an aspect that of was... it. That, in fact, there were some we, we people we saw that that were, you know, here's your diagnosis. That's it. <laughs> Go live what so you got. So how left. did you learn to live and live? Well, you and Linda live well. How did you all learn to do that? Where did that come from? Your background well, or something else? Yeah, um, I guess our background um, in 
and just who we are. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we, we initially didn't live too well after the mm -hmm. diagnosis. Um, uh, Linda kind of fell into a depression okay. and um, where we'd been optimistic the whole time that we're going to beat this and then, then to be told that we weren't going to beat it. Yep. Uh, so Linda fell into a depression. Um, where were you? With her? Or when, were you depressed as well? Oh, would yeah. Would you say? Yeah. Yeah, okay. def definitely. Um, oh. I think she probably reached clinical depression. I don't think I was quite there. but Okay. Um, but I got there uh, pretty close to there when, when I saw her. She would tell me that I want to be died. Yeah. And, um, and there are a few occasions where it seemed like maybe she was wanting to be done with it. Speed that yeah. along. Yeah. Um, but she didn't. Um, but, um, but that was a real, real challenging part. But what seemed to change over time is that, um, uh, Linda's always been a very active outdoor person, um, uh, walking, running, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, fortunately, with what she had, uh, that didn't stop her. Um, she was um, active pretty much until the last year. And, um, and instead of focusing on the depression, I, I couldn't understand a lot of what she was saying at that mm -hmm. point. The words were, were failing. Um, but I knew her well. And... Um, and I just noticed a change in her where she seemed to kind of let go um, mm -hmm. and um, wasn't trying to fight anything anymore. And she would take great pleasure in small things like um, uh, she would pick uh, little holly berries off the tree or she would pick up leaves on the ground and just, explore, you know, look at them and examine them. And, and she seemed to take, you know, real delight in that. She would bring them home and, you know, we'd put them in a little jar if there were the berries or, yeah. you know, just by the leaves and... Um, and then that seemed to, I, I say, I, I feel like I kind of took her lead there because, mm -hmm. um, I feel like if, if she can do this, I can do this. And, um, um, and so I started to try to let go too. We didn't have any more expectations of mm -hmm. beating anything. We were just going to try to learn to live with it and experience life as best we could together for what time was left. So, and you did, you cared for her to the very end of her life yeah. and then, since then, you've chosen to do some things to support others um, yeah. and support yourself. Yeah. I'm retired from a, a career in naval aviation. And after mm -hmm. that, um, I went back to school and uh, in counseling. I've been, I was a psychotherapist, in fact, mm -hmm. when, she, um, when she was diagnosed. And okay. so I never intended to go into that area of counseling, of, right. of working with caregivers and people in early stage dementia, but it just kind of seemed to happen that way. Mm. And so for um, for years now, uh, even when she had uh, was first diagnosed, I, um, I started working more with, with uh, family caregivers and with people in the early stages of dementia. And, um, and I still do now, um, six, um, you know, six years after, almost yeah. seven years after her passing. So what does that do for you? Because I, I know that it helps others, but yeah. what is what part of it does it play in your self-care and your moving forward? Well, at first, I after she passed, I, I took some time off and mm -hmm. um, uh, just um, did a lot of reflecting, sitting out on the mm -hmm. patio and just doing nothing really, but just thinking, reflecting. And it, at that point, I felt like I'd, you know, I'd, lived a full life. I felt like I, you know, I raised a family with Linda and, um, um, and the, the kids are doing well. And, um, uh, I felt like I'd had two fulfilling careers and, um, and, um, Linda was gone and it'd be okay if I, if I went then too, I, I wasn't, you know, depressed or wanting yeah. to die, but it just seemed like I was just wondering if life was, was at an end for me too. You were complete. Then yeah, you were complete. Yeah, 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 it kind of felt like that, and mm. uh, but then gradually I started to feel like no, there's there's more ahead, and just mm. just wait for it, and then um, uh, kept seeing more uh, more families and uh, and more folks with um, dementia in the early stage, anyway, and um, and I started to feel like that's what I'm supposed to do for now, and then. Um, um, about, um, I guess it was about four years after Linda passed, I went to a, 
a high school reunion, um, 50 high school reunion, it was actually 51st because of COVID. Uh, and uh, um, they met someone that I had actually been uh, in school with since probably third grade. And I knew of her and she knew of me, but we had a few friends that overlapped, but mm -hmm. not much. But anyway, at the reunion, we uh, started talking more. And so we're, we're engaged now. And so, uh, so that was another a new, know, a new, new chapter. New chapter for you. Yeah, yeah. So if you were to have one thing you want to share yeah. with people moving forward from your experience, what would be the one takeaway message you think is super important for people um, with young onset atypical yeah. dementia in your life? I'd say um, don't fight life. Um, mm -hmm. um, learn to kind of roll with it. Learn to... Um, uh, be open to what life's teaching you and has to show you. And it, it seems to me that, that we're all on a, a journey here. And um, it feels very much that way to me. And uh, I think we're, we're here to learn things and grow and change. And um, I think I mentioned to you before, I would, I would change things in a minute for Linda's sake, where she wouldn't have to go through any of what she did, but it would not change it for me. I, I felt like I learned more and grew more caring for her than I ever had in my life. So um, so I think that learning and changing goes on and... Um, and so be open to the change. Be open to it, yeah. Yeah, because it is what it is. The That's question right. is, what shall you do with it? That's right, yeah. yeah. Life's gonna happen to you. You can try to change as, you know, uh, to <clears throat> control things as much as you can, but life is gonna happen and, uh, and learn to, to roll with those things. Cool. Remember what it has to teach you. Thanks, Gary. Thank you.